So, Pete's been kicked off. Um, we've just decided to kick Pete off the podcast because he was just not contributing anything. <laughs> no, he, he's busy this week, so he's not able to make it. So, um, so for this week anyway, we've got myself and we've got Ben, who's back again. And we've got someone called Cameron. Um, at C, uh, is, is your official title at CJ Media, mate? Is that how you prefer it's, to be referred yeah, to? C, it's CJ Media on YouTube and Twitter, but Cam, whatever, I'm not that bothered. All right, then. I just won't put David in front of your name and then it won't no, de- no, discredit right, you no. in any way, shape or form. <laughs> Bless him. Um, no, he's got his own media. He's got his own media channel. <laughs> Can't speak. Um, he's got his own YouTube channel, C- CJ Media 22, I believe it's called. Um, and he's actually made some pretty good videos. Actually, I've watched a few of them. Quite well spoken, quite articulate. So give yourself a, give yourself a subscribe. Um, subscribe to him if you want to after the video. But anyway, so this is episode four. So we've actually finally got a name for this podcast. And hopefully it's one that's going to stick for a long time. So we're going to, it's hashtag keep the faith podcast. It sort of sums up our feelings on Sunderland. It sort of sums up, well, Sunderland fans feelings generally, because it's like keep the faith, everything's going to be okay. Um, and yeah, so let's get into the agenda. Um, I've got, we've got quite a few things to talk, I would like to try and get through today, but one thing I will talk about first, and I'll, and I've mentioned this in the WhatsApp group and Ben will know this and I'll say this to Cameron as well. I want to quickly just mention a little tribute to Bradley Lowry, but I want to keep this brief just out of respect for his family because they won't want more attention than what they've got already. So I don't know if either of you just want to quickly say something about it and then we'll move on to the next thing. Uh, yeah, I don't mind jumping in on that. I think it's um, obviously it's so upsetting seeing him actually pass away. Mm. Everyone knew how ill he was and it's just such a such a young lad brought so much joy to the whole world of football again doesn't matter what club you support or anything like that the amount of Newcastle fans I've seen who he's just absolutely melted the heart and it's uh, it's just really sad to see him go actually yeah yeah I second Cameron's thoughts there I mean the boy lit up a, a very dull season last season he was the shining light of last season you know mm. and yeah condolences to his family yeah. And everyone involved with him as well. Exactly. I watched um, Jermaine Defoe's press conference where I, I only just watched it recently actually and is where he broke down during it, which I'm sure which was probably quite difficult to watch. But um I think it's 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 obviously has been coming, but it's obviously doesn't make it any easier for Bradley's parents. But at least he isn't in pain anymore and he'll be up with God and the angels and smiling on us as I'm sure he will do. He truly was an inspiration to everybody and I'm hoping that that cancer research will be more funded more as a priority now in the light of what's happened because it's not fair for a six year old to be taken away like that. So if 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 for whatever reason Bradley's parents are watching this or Bradley anyone of Bradley's family or anyone closely associated with him, you have support and you're not alone. You'll get through this. But rest in peace to Bradley. So we've got that out of the way. Um right so anyway, so let's move on to the next couple let's move on to the um agenda. So first of all, at the time of the recording, since the last week, we've made two signings. Um, not a permanent one yet, mind, but we have got two loan deals. We've got Brendan Galloway, I think his name is, and Ty- is it Tyler or Tyus Browning? Whichever Tyus, one. I think it's I think, Tyus. I thought it was Tyus. Um, so very quickly, I'll get um, any, either of you want to start. What are your thoughts on those two? I think I saw an Everton um, football writer, for, it might have been for, Liverpool, for the Chronicle, just doing like a quick like reaction piece to say that they are two solid signings for Sunderland in the Championship, but I don't know what you two think about them. Um, from what I've seen of them, Galloway definitely. I think Galloway has the potential to be an upcoming England centre-half, 100%. Very, very talented player at mm. centre-back. Browning, again, I haven't seen as much of him. From what I've heard from Everton fans, relatively solid. But definitely from what I'm hearing from other people who've seen a lot of them play, Galloway is probably the more solid of the two. He's also, um, he can play it right back as well as centre back. So you have that option with him as well. Makes him a little bit more versatile. Yeah, at Hoops yesterday, I was at Hoops. Um, Galloway came on the second half and played left back, which was, I mean, I think I think he struggled yesterday at left back. But obviously, first game in a new team, etc., you kind of expect that. Mm. Um, but yeah. I'm not sure about Brown and I haven't uh, saw much of him, but Galloway seems to be the one with uh, the most experience, so yeah. to speak. You know, he played a few games in the Premier League last season. And um, yeah, he must have been pressed. Fair enough. Well, I was going to say, uh, I was mentioning the fact that um, both of them seem, well, if, if I'm basing it off the fact that they're both solid signings, so I haven't watched enough of them, we're going to need a squad, basically. So we're going to have to try and, there's many solid signings we can get. 
that you know we can't be short of we, we can't be short of numbers in that respect. And but yeah, Ben did mention that he went to Hibs yesterday, so he's pretty much going to be our representative um, at Hibernian. Um, first of all, did either of you watch the Berry game or watch anything? I've seen the highlights. Yeah, I've seen the highlights. Yeah, um, quite a. At least it was a decent enough comeback. I mean, I don't really read too much into this because it's pre-season and, and it's just a friendly at the end of the day. The real business starts when we play Derby. But um, the fact we came from 2-0 down must be some sort of encouragement. And Maya will have confidence from getting two goals. His second one was a screamer, actually. Very good finish, the second goal, yeah. And I suppose it's a little bit different to last season where we would have just laid down and died at that point, no matter who we were playing, really, if we were two goals down. It was nice to actually see a little bit of fight. Like you say, you don't want to read too much into it because it is only pre-season, but it's actually nice to see us have the mental strength to come back from two goals down. Yeah, yeah we were pro- we were fearing the worst of our certainly was. I listened to the commentary and uh, being 2-0 down after very little going on in the game. You start to think, even though it is pre-season, like Cameron said, you don't want to read into it. You, your mind starts thinking, mm, is, it, "Is it going to be like this again?" But yeah, it was nice to see them have the, have the, you know, the fight to come back, and hopefully that will continue into the first game of the season. You'd like to hope so. You'd like to hope so. Um, I mean, certainly, again, like Cameron touched upon there, I grew the amount of times that we just. Lay down and just took it up the arse, basically. About the amount, the amount of times we just gave up the second we went behind was just absolutely r- r- ludicrous for me. You know, you can't really get the amount of time. You can't really get. We shouldn't get away with that, really, as a footballer. You should. It should be instilled in here. Oh, I don't know. But anyways, no, we've got we got a, we've got a decent um, result, and obviously the main thing about preseason is to try and get fitness up. You have to try and improve it. You have to try and just make sure you're ready for the start of the season. Um. On the opposite side, however, obviously Ben was at Hibernian yesterday. Um, so, and as opposed to going two 0 down and winning three two, we went two 0 up and then drew twos each. So, on the positive side, we're unbeaten in two games in the preseason. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I watched the highlights um, not long ago, and I'll tell you, I was quite impressed with them. I was quite impressed with both the goals. I thought both ours were well taken, even though Lens again, when he celebrated, well, ce- celebrate with hashtag quotation marks, but. Didn't you know? Um, didn't really look interested, and then obviously two poor goals to concede. That's that's when I looked at it. So Ben, you'll be able to tell more than me. You'll go for yeah, it. St- kicking off with Lens, uh, he he warmed up right in front of the Sunderland fans in the first half, and I've never saw so much abuse get given to a Sunderland player ever. It, it, I think everyone in the stand abused him, so it's clear that the fans don't want him, and he probably doesn't want to be there either. But yeah, good, great finish by him probably wants to put himself in the shop window, no doubt. But yeah, I mean, first half, we started well, we started passing well. It's obvious that Grayson wants us to pass the ball out from the back. Um, with Madge starting up front, he, he had a good impact at the start, but he faded out of the game. Um, but yeah, we we're, were solid in midfield. I thought Gibson and Rodwell were, were okay in there, but they never really got troubled. Mm. Um, but yeah, Second half changed a bit. Uh, started getting a little bit fiery in the second half. Actually, there was a bit of commitment. Um, Catmull ended up getting into a few scraps. We're good to see the passion, of course. But the young guys, especially Reese Greenwood, impressed me yesterday. And um, he took his uh, assist very well for Lens' goal. A bit of quick thinking. And yeah, I mean, the, the the general player could be could be a bit quicker, but obviously that'll come in time when they're all fitter. Mm. You can tell that Hibbs. You know, are playing games earlier than us. I'm sure they've got a Betfred Cup game next week, so they they would naturally be fitter than what our team were. Um, just I want to ask you, mate. Just obviously because I've only seen the highlights. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, definitely you've got to look at Mika for their first goal because it's just a goalkeeper shouldn't be beating us from post in the fashion that he was. But I just want to know what you thought about um. Tom Beelan at centre half because when I watched both the goals I thought he looked pretty suspect for them almost yeah I, th- I think that was shown we were definitely weaker at the back in the second half yeah with obviously Corny and Gillibodji didn't you know sweeping up no problem didn't really get troubled at all but um, yeah when we had uh, Beelan and O'Shea there and also the full backs didn't really help I mean Adam Matthews for the first one yeah. I mean the whole game, well, the whole second half when Matthews was there, we were suspect down that side. 
<laughs> it was it was incredible how bad Matthews was actually. Yeah. Are, you, are you still of the opinion you were a couple of weeks ago? You know when you said Matthews got experience in the championship, and now and then uh, I think we remember looking at the stats and like he only played like six games for Bristol City, which is quite worrying. So surely you must be looking to sell him then if what you're if what yeah. you're saying is accurate. I think I think we do need to sell him. Yeah, you know, unfortunately. Well, there's there's a whole host of players we need to sell, but. Well, I mean, was was would you say there's positives for Sunderland to take from the game then? I suppose, given oh, what yeah, you watched. Massive positives. Massive positives. I mean, the the whole uh, the, the player was quicker, and it was nice for us to go forward and not seeing the usual side side passing that we had under probably the last six managers. You know, they were actually actively getting forward. People were making runs. Gooch up front in the second half struggled massively, but you know he's not forward. That's something that. You know, when they look in the transfer window for, yeah, um, and and that didn't help. You know, the centre backs and people in midfield because we weren't making it stick up front. So naturally, there was a whole load of pressure on mm. on them guys. You know, because we we just couldn't make it stick. Fair enough. I'm not sure if any did any of you see them Grayson's interview after the game. Yeah, I just not long watched it. Um, yeah, just on a little um. Because what I've been hearing, I know a couple of the lads who were in the first team squad played there. Uh, Reese Greenwood, Michael Ledge, I used to have played with a couple of them. And um, what I'm hearing from them is that in all of the pre-seasons they've done under any of the managers at Sunderland, this is the most strenuous and difficult and hard-working one they've ever done by a long shot. And I think it's about two minutes into his interview, if you actually look behind them, there was three of the lads who didn't feature. And they were... Oh, yeah, they were, were running across the pitch, the pitch, weren't they? Yeah, they were doing yeah, sprints across the pitch after the game since they didn't play. Um. I mean, personally, I think that's a massive positive if we're looking at working players as hard as possible and having players as fit as possible for a high-press system that it looks like he's probably going to want to play. Just wonder what you think about it. I'd agree. I think certainly that if you're going to have... You're going to have to get their fitness up somehow. Even if they're not playing, they might be called upon from the bench during the season. And you've got to remember, the championships are relentless division. You've got 46 games, and a majority of them will come at you in bursts. You'll have, like, three games in a week. You'll have a Saturday... Tuesday slash Wednesday, Saturday. So you're going to have to get used to running around, getting fitter. You're going to have to run, run used to getting running around high intensity because let's face it, if we're going to... I've said in the past, I feel a club like Sunderland should be winning the championship. And I've said it doesn't mean I think we've got a right to do it. But if we're going to try and get promoted, what we're going to have to do is constantly press teams and constantly press opposition into making mistakes. And the best way to do that is by high intensity. And if we're trying to, if we're going to, if he's trying to implement that early enough, then that can only be a positive, given that he's pretty much still got under about at least three and a half weeks away until the first game. So you'd hope by the time we play Derby, we'd, we'd have some, what's the word, style of play or system in place that we can then sort of use against sort of use against opposition. But I mean, if it's going to be, if if what if that's the case, then uh, Cameron, then then Cameron, fair enough. Um, I think that's got to be a massive positive from what you've just said, anyway. It was clear yesterday, Mike. It was clear that he wants to play at high intensity. Yeah, that's what I've noticed yeah. from watching yeah. highlights. I mean, obviously, I haven't been to either of the games, and you'll know definitely better than me, but from the word go, I mean, even against Bury, you saw Gooch closing down instantly, and all of the players were instantly just high pressing, closing down as fast as they could. Yeah, and I'll tell, yeah. you, what, I'll tell you what, I will mention this. Um, on to- I think I was listening to Total Sport. Um, I know Ben's listened to it. I don't know kind of if you listened to it, if you've listened to it at all in the past. But um, last season, I've listened to um, was it John Anderson, obviously who represents Newcastle, and he mentioned something that actually what you've just said is going to be very applicable to us this coming season. Um, you'd if Newcastle, I think he said that Newcastle Benitez would have Newcastle working as hard as the opposition, and because you've got that extra quality, that will tell in the end, and that's got to be applicable for us. If we work as hard as the opposition consistently which by sounds of it under grace is what I'd hope we are going to do, then hopefully we'll have that extra quality that will be the difference in a lot of games. Because I do think, and I've said in the past, we want match winners who will be, who will help get us over the line. But I think, honestly, we, if, we, if we work as hard as the opposition and have that bit of extra quality, that honestly will make the difference in many, many matches. Yeah, you would hope so. And I also think that when you're playing against championship opposition, if you're especially using a high-press system, you're going to force so many more mistakes. There's a lot more mistakes in championship players than there are in Premier League players. Mm. So, for example, if you're pressing a back four, the chances are you're going to get the ball back a lot more higher up the pitch using a high-press system. It's um, 
it should definitely be something that works in our favour as long as we have the fitness and quality to maintain it. Yeah, I mean, definitely, uh, you've got to play the high press system with the players we've got as well. You know, Soro, Majed, they're all high press players. Like Gooch, Gooch, Gooch is a you know box to box player. Let's use him to his strengths and press high. And yeah, the, the, also the little interchange with passing on the edge of the box as well, on the edge of the opposition's box was really good yesterday. It was just quick one touch stuff, which we know we didn't see under David Moyes at all. It was all slow and. We didn't see anything under David Moyes. <laughs> well, yeah, of course. But yeah. yesterday you could see it. You could see it kind of molding together. And obviously it will come in the next few pre-season games, and it should it should be good to watch, and it should be effective as well. Exactly. And again, you're going to come up against opposition with, with all due respect, will have inferior players to Sunderland. So it goes back to the point I made earlier. If you keep on pressing and then you've got the extra quality, that will that will sort of tell in the end. Um, anyway, one thing I will ask, and um, I asked last night, um, I didn't get many responses, but I didn't expect you to be fair. Um, well, I, I got, so I got, um, I put out the tweet saying, obviously we're recording the podcast, and it was just basically if anyone's got any questions that they wanted to answer him. One of them, and I know I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, so I apologise. Is um, I think it's J J D Burrell. I know I've got that wrong. We sort of tweet each other quite a bit, and obviously, I think she put this tweet out as a joke, but nevertheless, I'll mention it anyway. Lee Barry Catamore. <laughs> Everyone, uh, if Cam, if you've probably, I think you said you've listened to the previous couple of pods, so you'll know that I've pretty much got a love affair with Lee Barry Catamore. I absolutely, I, I love him as a player. I think I saw some rumour that apparently um, Chelsea were linked with him. Yeah, I um, saw that today as well. I was like, and piss I, off. Um, unless, unless we have N'Golo Kante, get lost. You can't have him. <laughs> I was, um, uh, yeah, because it was you who, um, it was your retweet that I'd seen from it, like your quote of it. And to be honest with you, I think I agree with you. I, I really highly rate Catamore. And I think if you could epitomise what Sunderland fans want from a player, you would build Lee Catamore. It's that mm. hard work and passionate player who, wears his heart on his sleeve and you know that every single week he goes out it's gonna be he's gonna give hundred percent. Exactly. Even if even if you, even if you know you're not gonna get the best quality from him, even if you know and actually I do think he has got qualities like his I ball agree, his yeah. ball retention, his distribution. I think that some of his passing is actually very, very good. It's very underrated actually. Um but they, it gets overlooked because of the so called reputation that he's got. Uh, even yeah, though people keep you saw about that reputation there was a stat when we were in the Premier League two years ago I think. And it came out where it was the amount of tackles players get away with before they get a yellow card. And Catamore was at that the like lowest number of tackles. I think it was about every 4.3 tackles. And next, I can't remember who it was, but they were sitting on about 8.1 or 8.2. So that reputation, is, it definitely goes before him because he's given so many fewer chances than other players before he gets booked. Yeah, I remember there was one, um, yeah. I think twice we played at Newcastle like, a few years ago. The first one was when, I think it was the year they finished fifth. Um, and he went, uh, to be fair, like he did go right into Teote straight away and got a yellow card in the instant, even though Teote made about five or six equally as dirty fouls before the referee finally gave him a booking. And the yeah. second one was before Christmas a couple of years ago when we won 1-0. And it was the same thing. He slid in. He slid into, um, who was it? don't think it was Teote. I think it was another player. But either way, he made a really rough, he made a tackle. I think it was either cautioned or booked straight away. So it's, but I agree with you. In fact, the fact his reputation goes before him, people forget it's been quite a long time since he's actually been sent off. Um, yeah. You know, people do conveniently forget that. But I just think, like, I agree. If if, if anyone epitomises what Sunderland are as a club, it's Lee Catamore. I think Michael Proctor might have said it um, at one point. So, you know, I'd agree. And I think if if, if we lose Catamore, I think I will break down crying. <laughs> I honestly I mean, will. He played, he played well yesterday, like, to be fair. He brought a lot of passion like he always does. Mike mm. could have been sent off yesterday. I don't know if it shows it in the highlights package, but um, probably not because they've, they've got they've got yeah, to be positive. They've got to be positive whenever they put yeah, anything out. I was going to say it wouldn't be in their best interest to show what he did, but you hear me in the two footed tackle that was pretty dangerous in the air, caused the outrage of the hoops players, and uh, it did all kick off. But yeah, nice to see the passion, of course. I've got yeah, uh, passion off the bar score. as well, didn't he? Yeah, yeah I was thinking oh, he was unlucky not to score. Yeah, it was a fantastic strike. It was controlled. You know, he was really unlucky. And that would have put us 3 0 up, which would have been more convincing. Yeah. But uh, that's just the way it goes sometimes. Well, yeah. I mean, apparently, apparently from what. Well, I'm, this will sort of lead on to my next point. Um, 
I, I, when I said we wa- said earlier we watched Grayson's post match interview, um, and he basically said that like for the first 65 70 minutes that we played really really well. So again, I'm going to assume Ben that that was the case. The first 65 70 minutes were we were we controlling the game? Were we were we dictating yeah. it in so in so many ways? I'm guessing obviously Tyner's probably came in at the end. Yeah, I think I think we didn't have any problems up until 70 minutes, and when yeah our players probably did start to tire a bit um but i i, th- I think adam matthews and clean gooch up front was all kind of the downfall there because we like you said like i said before we just weren't holding the ball up front and it was just putting a lot of pressure on the guys at the back and i, th- I think galloway was a bit nervous playing at left back at both, both goals obviously came from the wings the wing areas and mm. yeah uh, Matthews just wasn't switched on at all. Mind both of our goal, both of their goals, you know, came from fouls that that we should have had a free kick for, and the referee was a really poor. He honestly, Scott, if that's the you know the level of their referee in Scotland, I, ho- I hope we never do pre season there again. If I'm totally honest, <laughs> well, it, put, it was that bad. Well, put it, it put it put it bad. this way. A lot of Newcastle fans on Twitter have been really determined to tell me that apparently the referees are absolutely atrocious in the championship. So, oh god, I guess we're going to have to get used to. Guess we're going to have to get, if that's if yesterday's if yesterday's in it, if yesterday's a pre pre example of what it's like, then like a preview of what it's like, then God help. Me. Yeah, I mean Newcastle had the penalty last season, didn't they? That was meant to be retaken. Was this against yes. Burton? I think it yeah. was. Yeah, and he gave an indirect free kick. Yeah, apparently, you know, so you just think, I well, mean, if that's if that's a if that's the championship referee, and then especially considering a club like Sunderland, season. a club like Sunderland historically doesn't get the rub of the green with referees anyway. And I know every, I know fans of every club will probably say, it, but honestly, we don't. I've watched enough of Wood to see that we don't get it. We don't get the rubber decisions. But you'd like to hope in the championship that we would. But then again, nothing surprises me anymore. So. Uh, well, I hope the football league sitting down with the relevant people this summer and kind of pointing these things out. Because if they don't. Yeah, we're in for a big shot like down there. More than likely. Standard. More yeah. than likely. Well, anyway, I, I mentioned Grayson earlier, and the second question. Now, again, this is from a mate of mine, James, on Twitter, who's a lovely lad on Twitter, very underrated as a as a lad, but it's at James SXO. So I probably got that wrong, mate, but there's your shout out. It's basically just the two of you. Thoughts on Grayson so far, since he's obviously come in. So we've obviously had two games. He's sort of come. I'll stop this one very quickly. I think. Um, or for me, quickly, sort of probably about five minutes, Cameron, just to warn you. But um, Ben knows I won't belong quite a bit. But I think Grayson, when he since he's come in, I think he, he hasn't had that much. He doesn't have he doesn't have to have a set a high benchmark for himself. And what I mean by that is the benchmark's so low for mood around the place because of what happened with Moyes, because of what happened last season, that Grayson can come in, sound relatively positive, and then straight away he's got the mood better. But he seems to have done, to be fair. And if we're doing high intensity stuff in training, and it's coming across in games, and we're practicing it. It's got to be a positive for it. He's got a seemingly positive attitude with the press. He's got a seemingly positive attitude with Martin Bain when I watched the press conference um, just over a week and a half ago. Um, that can only be a good thing. So, I mean, so I'll say get behind him at the moment, but obviously time will tell who will be in the pudding when the season starts. So, either yeah, you two true. start. No, I, mean, I think I definitely agree with you. I'd say he, he, he's 100% saying the right things and hearing him in his first press conference with the club... Obviously, when you've had so long with David Moyes, I mean Moyes coming in at the start of at the start of his management at Sunderland and saying that we're in a relegation battle two games into the season and things like that that you don't want to hear as a fan. Grayson's definitely saying the right things, as you say, high intensity attacking football, moving the ball forwards with some actual purpose. It'll be nice to see for a change after a season of mm. just playing sideways and backwards. And yeah, I think. 100% you've got to get behind him. He knows the championship. He spent a lot of years managing in the championship. And I think for where we are right now as a club, it's he's a very good appointment. He's what we need. Can I bet? Yeah, yeah, I'll second that. Um, something that I you know, found out yesterday about Grias, watching him in real time for the first time, is that he barks out orders and Moyes didn't do that all season. He was, he was constantly on the touchline giving out orders. And, you know, he... He, he comes across as that guy who he will play football with them in training. He'll not just stand on the sidelines. He'll get himself involved. He wants to be at the forefront where the last few managers I've always got the impression mm. where they just want to sit in the background. But I think, I think you know, he's coming 
by Gary Cameron say he said the positive things. And yeah, proof will be in the pudding. But he's start he's had a good start with getting, you know, the two loan signings in. Considering how long it normally takes Sunderland to do business, I think he's been really positive in that and he's obviously got the trust of Martin Bain. Uh, you know, so yeah, hope, hopefully yeah. he gets a few more signings in this week. Well, like I said last week, um I think the fact that Grayson's come in and not um been put off, so to speak, by the lack of money and whatnot, by the budgetary thing. To me, pardon me, I see that as a positive because even I think again, Pete said it last week. I think Ben, if you remember, I think he said even Sunderland in debt should offer more money than a debt-free Preston yeah. North End. So yeah. um, again, no disrespect to Preston. Obviously, I hope they do well the coming season. By the way, but um, I just think. You know, this is definitely the biggest club that Grayson's managed in his career. I know Leeds are a big club, but when I say big, I don't just think of history. I mean, I probably think of more recent history than anything else. And I think certainly Sunderland's a bigger proposition than Leeds to get back into the Premier League, um, or we should be, anyway. Yeah, definitely. I think I made, this, I made the same point on Twitter that I said, if you're not looking at history, then obviously you'd say Leeds. But oh, I no doubt. The, no I doubt. think we're the first club that Grayson's been in charge of that genuinely has potential while he's in charge to be a Premier League club. So this is his first chance to make mm. that step, in my opinion, realistically. Yeah, well, to, to me, to me, Sunderland as a club, and I'm not, again, the way I phrase it, I think I probably do phrase it poorly, but to me, as a club, Sunderland shouldn't be in the Championship in the first place. Not with the stadium, the facilities, the fan base they've got. They shouldn't be anywhere near the Championship. Don't get us wrong, thoroughly, thoroughly deserve to get relegated last year, but to me, that was mainly because the majority of players didn't try. Um, or didn't try enough in order to make sure that we actually stayed up. But regardless, yeah, um, I think this is, I mean, I think, I think Ben made the point last week, is that, um, Ben made the point last week, rather, that this is Grayson's best chance to become a Premier League manager. So that's got to be one side note motivation for him. But he obviously will be motivated to do well. He has to, because obviously he's a Sunderland manager, but he just, it's a chance for him to get into the Premier League, isn't it? 100%, yeah. 100% is a chance for him to get in there. I think as long as in the coming weeks he makes the right signings, I think he needs to bring in at least two genuine striking options like an actual centre forward mm. so we're not having to play players like Gooch up there yeah. I think the problem you're going to have to worry about the fact that obviously Lenz, Lenz will go because on top of the fact that he's disliked by the fans and he dislikes the club he's not a second tier player he is a, he is a very good player given all his attitude problems it does hold him back or else he'd, be at a, he'd definitely be at a bigger club in Sunderland yeah. but I, I think he's going to go I think I'd be very surprised if Coney doesn't go somewhere because from what I've seen from him in the first two preseason friendlies, he doesn't really doesn't really look like he wants to be there. He's almost playing the same way that he did after the Everton over got rejected. Is it still like going through the motions sort of thing? thing. Yeah, yeah, just going through the motions. I think if you definitely if you watch the second goal against Hibbs, he's he's walking back at the point where the, the ball actually ends up in the back of the net. I know he had been dragged out of position, but there's no kind of effort there to get back. Similar in the Bury game, it just kind of looks again like he doesn't really want to be there. Whether it's a pre-season thing or whether it's the fact that he wants to leave the club, again, it's pretty similar to what happened after the Everton Nova got rejected last year. So I think you've got to look to strengthen us up top and at centre-back, but if he does that and he does it well, there's no reason that we can't put a title challenge up in the Championship. Yeah, I agree. Ben, thought. Yeah, yeah, there was times yesterday where, you know, up front we could have had someone running at the back post, you know, just, you know, instinct striker because Lenz was putting in some absolutely great balls across yeah. the box and there were just tap-ins, Gooch wasn't there, you know. Mm. So, yeah, up, up front because it was painful watching the second half yesterday going forward, like, I mean, apart from, obviously, Catamull hitting the post and Lenz scoring. There was nothing else in the 45 minutes of the second half. So, yeah. And as you say, Cornea going through the motions, yeah, that, that's that's definitely true. You know, you can, see, you can see in his body language that he doesn't want to be here. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, who, who would you guys think of getting in in that position? I'll tell you who, who I wish we still had. I think Victor and each of be this season the championship would have been yeah. ideal. They are very, very good mm. championship player. The size of him, the strength of him. I mean, he, even uh, bar his injury last season, he looked pretty solid. He did look relatively solid when he played in the Premier League. And I think that he would definitely do a job in the championship. But unfortunately, that's not going to be the case. Yeah, I would agree with that. But at the same time, I would argue how, mu how much of it is he going to be fit for? But it's also the common argument response to that 
that if he wasn't injury prone, would he be here? Would he, would he have been at Sunderland in the first place? Probably not. I'll tell you one thing. Well, I will go on to the point of trying but um, um, I will go on to the point of transfers actually because I'm looking at an article right now from the Northern Echo. So shout out to them if they're somehow if anyone's somehow watching this. Um, I've read a couple of contradictory articles. The Chronicle ones, I think there was a Chronicle put out a headline saying Grayson said that Wabi Kazri and Jeremy Lenz could obviously leave if they want to. Um, but then he said, but then Scott Wilson, is it Scott Wilson? I think it is who's put this article up for the Northern Echo, whoever it is has put it up. It says, after watching his side draw their second preseason game at Hibernian on Sunday, Simon Grayson hinted that the two goal scorers, Wabi Kazri and Jeremy Lenz, could still have a future at the Stadium of Light. So first and foremost, um, I'll try as little as possible to bang on the drum about Wabi Kazri, because to me, Kazri's a player at all costs we should be trying to keep. But if he doesn't want to be here, then fair enough, you have to get rid of him. You don't want any bad apples in the... I think Pete made the point off there, you don't want any bad apples in the dressing room, and I'd agree with that completely, but... Kasri, for the short condensed version. Kasri, if he wants to be here, if he's willing to be here, keep it all cost. Lens, piss off. <laughs> there you go. I thought Kasri played with the right attitude yesterday. I had yeah. no qualms with Kasri yesterday, yeah. I thought he was fully committed. No, no. You know, you can see the difference between him and Lens. So, yeah, Kasri's the main one I'd want to keep. Yeah. 100%. As long as, we, yeah, as, long as yeah, we get a good figure, as long as we get a good fee for Lens, then... I think the thing that um, I think I, I tweeted it out yesterday. I think the issue Kasri had was that I don't think Moyes knew how to deal with a flair player. I don't think he enjoys he enjoyed managing flair players. Mm. I mean, he yeah. made the point at one point in the season saying that he wanted like a, the Britishness in midfield, and he was playing Billy Jones because he needed British players in his team. So I think there was definitely a, a lack of love felt for Kasri from mm. Moyes. He didn't know and how to I use think him though, that did he? Under Grayson, he should be able to nurture him, hopefully. You'd like to hope so. Moyes just didn't know how to use Kasri. He didn't even try to use Kasri, and that was the yeah. enough. And you could clearly see last season when we were playing against the likes of Watford and Burnley. Yeah, granted, we didn't score in either of those games, but we still looked like much more of a purpose about us when Kasri came on. The I mean, and Don came on, don't get us wrong, and he helped as well. But yeah. with Kasri, he made a difference. And we can't pretend like, even when the 3Ks, when Allardyce got Coney, Kasri, Kirchhoff, and all them in, Kasri made the least impact of the three of them. And he was probably the least popular. But you can't ignore the fact that he still did make an impact. And I don't particularly buy this argument with Kazri that, oh, well, his attitude must be rotten. His attitude must be rotten. Does Allardyce like players with rotten attitudes? Yeah, Allardyce used him. So um, I, I, he found again, a way to use him. It's being able to manage those personalities that mm. hopefully I think Grayson would do. Allardyce was very good at that. Allardyce could, I think he knew how to what he had to do with different players to get them motivated for a game and hopefully Grayson can do the same thing and, and bring him back into being almost one of our main stable mm. players for the rest of the season yeah I mean yeah I think I think he's doing a good job so far because Kasri looked well, well up for it yesterday yeah. I mean I think maybe they've given up on Lens because you know he it's a two way street and Lens is not you know yeah. returning the favour yeah. yeah and, and you got to bear in mind Lens will probably be on significant wages as well yeah. So I would, I would like to think that if we, the sooner we get Lens out the door, then the better for me. Because I think if you if you can get, see, knowing me, I would say get an offer of ten million for him. But realistically, we're probably not going to get anywhere near that much. But I would just think if you can get a decent offer for Lens of say at least seven to eight million, part your get, cut your losses and just say right, fine, just just go, and then you've got is Dick is, is out for cut managing anyone. The National Holland side, I think. No, is it the Nash, Dutch, uh, Na, National Dutch side or something, I think? That's that's a shame. If he was managing the club side, we could have yeah, just palmed Lens back off. Someone the, will be interested in him. That would have been a nice, easy uh, revenue yeah. stream. To be, fair, though, to be fair, though, I think I, think I heard Fenerbahce are still interested yeah. in him. Yeah, Fenerbahce want him back, don't they? Yeah, so... but it depends on whether they can afford to pay the... Mate, it seems like everybody's strapping for cash at the minute, like... <laughs> like, come on. Outside the Premier League, pretty much. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, as far as I'm concerned... Lens is good enough a player to attract interest. And you've got to remember, in the Dutch league or in other leagues, there's not as big an emphasis to work hard, and especially because it's not in the North East, because as you know, Sunderland and Newcastle fans, whichever set of fans up here, like players who work hard first and foremost yeah. and who give 100%. And the, the annoying thing is, if Lens really wanted it, well, first of all, he wouldn't be here if he did anyway, so it's half irrelevant. But the point is, if he really wanted it here and he actually fucked his ideas up, he would piss all over the championship. <laughs> He would really, he really would be the best. He'd be the best player yeah. by a country distance in that division, easily. He's, he's, he's a he's a top tier player. He's a top tier talent. He has the he has the potential again, like you say. The, the problem is 
the, the reason he's at Sunderland is because he doesn't have the right attitude for it, and that's why he's at a club like Sunderland. Because if not with his talent, mm. he could be playing the top five, top six club in the Premier League, no problem at all, starting every. You know, but I mean, like it's like Ben said earlier, I'm I'm just of the opinion I'm more concerned about whether we keep Kazri. I'm not really that too fussed about Len. If Lens did stay and somehow wanted suddenly wanted it, which is not going to happen, then yeah, fair enough, keep him. But I just think you know, with Kazri, he's the one that we, I'm more concerned about keeping because I honestly think he'll be a huge asset in the championship given his set pieces, his running around, working hard and he's got he's got a big threat going forward and that would unlock a lot of defences in my opinion and with the right players around him. Yeah, the, the, link, the link with Madger and Kazri yesterday was absolutely fantastic to see. It's like they the knew where each other was going to be and that's a really positive sign going into the season because they, cause they were very linked up and they were at Bury as well. Yeah. You know? I'll tell you one thing, though. Do, do, do you think that means there's a hint that Kazri might stay? Now, I know there was an article on it. Was it Le Quip, the French um, website that said he wanted to leave? And he said that before Gre- He said that around about the time Moyes left. So, to me, the reason that I think he would want to leave was purely, was mostly down to David Moyes. Um, and now that he's gone, I just... Am I being... Um, do, I, do you two tell me if you think I'm being overly optimistic here? I think there's a chance Kazri will stay, personally. Um, I think he will stay. I mean... I think that the club will look to try and get him to stay, and he's not getting. It's not like I mean I don't know Ben no better than me, but I'm assuming that he didn't get any kind of abuse from the fans yesterday, especially definitely not on the same level as Lens would anyway. No, he didn't get any. Yeah, see, and I think yeah. that that's that. I mean, it might be that he only stays till January. And then looks to move on then, but he doesn't. He, it's not like he's coming off the back of a of a good season last season. He hardly played. So exactly, and that when that was down to Moyes. Is, so yeah, it is. Yeah, but so the problem is clubs aren't going to part with what six, seven, eight million pounds on a player who hasn't played at all mm. last season. So I think that if he's even if he's looking at it from a personal point of view, he's got to go right. Well, I need to, I'm going to have to stay until January, and I'm going to have to perform. Which again, if if it comes to January, we have to get rid of him then because he's playing that well. Well, at least we've got four or five months out of him of solid performances. And you'd like to hope by yeah. that point he would have won us enough he would have won us a good amount of points to be in the top six at least. Um but I mean, like I said, I just think it's it, and that's another point financially, I just think it'd be much cheaper to keep him because how much are you going to get for him now as opposed to how much it's going to cost to replace him. So Yeah. Personally yeah, I think he'll be like a new sign in the grace. I think his attitude will be different. And yeah, yeah, if he does stay till you know January, I'm sure he'll um, I'm sure he'll have a good impact on the players who come in as well. Exactly. Now, one thing I will quickly mention, mention from one of the three Ks. Well, Kershaw's obviously I think already left now, but from one of the three Ks to another of the three Ks, Corny. The same article I'm reading from the Northern Echo, and I want to mention this. Corny, um, right, Ben, did Corny play yet? Did Corny play yesterday at all? Yeah, he played the first half. Right, did he look like he wanted to be here? Did he look like he was just... I, I know we've probably half-touched on this already, but did he look like he was going through the motions and thinking, OK, I really want to move away from here, but I'm playing because I'm pretty much forced to or being told to play? You've summed it up very well, yes. The straight answer, yeah, he was going through the motions, you could tell. Just his body language, you, you could tell. It wasn't like he was committed like he was in the first season. He was at some hmm. Well, if that's yeah. the case, then... Um, you two probably will have seen that Burnley have been linked with him. Now, this pro- now usually I would think Corny is a pre- for me is, for as far as I'm concerned. If you take Corny's attitude out of it, he is a Premier League defender. He's he, he proved it when he first came here, and even the very start of like the very start of last season, he was still of that same standard. But obviously, with his attitude, it is it does go into question here. Now, Burnley have just sold Michael Keane, obviously, um, not long ago to Everton, and they'll be looking for a centre back. Do either of you two see any legitimacy, if that's not even the right word, but you know what I mean, do you see anything legit in the fact that Burnley would be linked with a move for um, Lamine Corne? Can you see Corne going to Burnley, potentially? Yeah, I I definitely can. I think he wants to play Premier League football. You can see from his body language he doesn't want to be here yet. He's not going to get the Everton offers and offers from clubs of a similar stature like that again until mm-hmm. he starts putting in performances in the Premier League so I think Burnley would be a good move for him Yeah I agree with Cameron I, th- I think um, you know he does want to play Premier League football 
and I think you know Sean Dyche might be a good manager for him to work under. You know, quite a tough guy. He'll get he'll get his attitude right again. Can you just imagine, you just imagine, uh, can you imagine, sorry, sorry, man. can you imagine if M. Um, Coney just sort of like down tools on the pitch or just didn't, like, try imagine going into training on a Monday morning, it's like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, you know, like, Dice looks really pissed off. He's like, yeah, I'm really in for it here. <laughs> I'd love yeah, to see I, mean, I think, yeah, I think that is a, is a point because if you look at the manager that he performed the best under for Sunderland, it's Allardyce, and Allardyce is the kind of manager who wouldn't allow players to just down tools and go through the motions and not be bothered. Mm. So I think that maybe a, a, a manager with that kind of attitude and a similar way that I think Sean Dyche has that would probably get the best out of him as a player. You'd like to hope so. So in that case, I mean, it says in the article that Dyche regards Coney as a viable option. Although, it, But here's the key bit. Although it remains to be seen whether he'd be willing to offer the kind of sum that Sullen would deem acceptable. Now, what 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 price tag would you two set on Coney if he was to if he was to go... How old's Coney? He's not that old, is he? 20, he's like is he twenty? No, I think he's older than that. He's like twenty-eight, I think. Twenty-eight, is he? But he's but that's but that's still another. That's still at least four years or so in the Premier. Really, yeah, if you're looking at it from a realistic, yeah. you could imagine you could still get three or four years at least out of that. So, the well, the, I mean, the, the, the big thing as well is that he's on sixty grand a week according to this article. If that's round about that, yeah. mind you, a few people have said that. To be fair, so but, I mean, if you look at some of the transfer fees being banded about for for players of, of average to good quality I think you should, you could be looking around the £10 million mark whether or not you'd actually get it is a different story yeah. but I was just thinking Burnley's willingness to pay that amount of money will be next will be very low I, th- I think they'll probably pay around seven, seven to £9 million for him yeah. I couldn't say I'm going into double figures for him like, but no, if we do I'll tell you what happy days if we do yeah yeah, yeah, but we've got to remember that it, if we even if it was say seven million, we would still make a profit on Corney because we only paid five. But it would be disappointing given that even though obviously this was before last season that we could have had eighteen million um, a year ago. So I just think anything less than ten, I just don't think we should be accepting or entertaining the idea of it because don't get us wrong. I know pe- people could real could probably argue with some validity that um, you know you don't want to. We can't. We're not in a position to go around and say pay this, this, this or this or you're not getting him. But my counter-argument to that is that's all the more reason to do it. If you need the money, you, you've got to be mean. You've got to be stubborn in the transfer market. You've got players there who I think Premier League Premier League clubs would take a chance on. I honestly do. I think a Premier League club will take the chance on Corny. I think there's there's a good few others. You could, you know, there's a good few others that Premier League clubs would want to take a chance on. So you've, you've got to, it's, it's a seller's market. You've, you've, you, we hold the power at the end of the day. As to where these players go and how much for, so we've we've got to be you know you look at the pick bid thing, so this is all the more reason to do it. And again, it gets if it gets Coney's wages off the books and you get a centre back who actually wants to be here and actually bothers, then happy days, like Ben said, really. The flip side to that though is that if we don't let him go, we've got a really unsatisfied player there and he's in the dressing room. That's true. Yeah, that's, a, that's a massive point. I think that can almost be that can be massively overlooked about how much of an effect a bad attitude can have on a dressing room. Mm. But again, I think the other point you've got to look at is, we, I mean, we, we have a massive debt. We are in one of the highest debts in Europe as a club. And I think if you can bring in seven or eight million pounds for Coney and get his wages off the books, I think that the powers that be above Grayson might say, listen, you, that, that, that's an offer that we can't refuse. Yeah. Fair enough. I, I don't blame them for that either. No, me either. But I mean, I'm not sure if you saw the article at the end of the season, but we paid out more money in wages last season than Atletico Madrid did. <laughs> and, and they got to they, they got to Oh, my God. So, that sums it up, really. That, that, didn't, that, didn't, that, wasn't the article saying, apparently, situation. didn't the article apparently say we got more in TV, we got more money, we earned more money from finishing bottom of the Premier League than what the likes of Atletico Madrid and Real Madrid got? From the TV deals, yeah, I think something like that. Those, uh, but but that that's kind of like half. That's kind of sorry, sorry to interrupt, Cameron. But coupled with the fact, coupled with the fact that I think we had like last season, didn't we have like a top ten Premier League wage bill, and yet we finished bottom. Yeah, yeah. and that, that that's another that's another reason. What by by the way, why I keep saying we underperform. You shouldn't have a top ten Premier League wage bill and constantly be struggling. So the problem you have though is that 
to get players to the northeast, you've got to pay that little mm. bit extra. Right? Like, I mean, I think if you look at a lot of a lot of players, even when we were in the Premier League, would rather go and sign for a side like QPR and play maybe that division below, but be living in London and have That's that lifestyle. True. Because the, the Premier League footballers now, or professional footballers as a whole, want to have that rock star lifestyle, the mm. like the celebrity underground lifestyle, where they can go out for a night out and not have uh, pictures taken of them by the press and all the rest of it. And that that isn't that doesn't exist in the northeast because there's not that many people of that kind of stature. So mm. that I think that's where the issue comes with paying out the extra money. But it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. We shouldn't be looking close to Atletico Madrid for our wage bill when you look at the difference in performance. Like, exactly. That's absolutely ridiculous. Well, I'll tell you what, you did mention though that, that they couldn't really go for a night without with a, look for a night out lifestyle. They're not. They're not been to the bridges, by Alden Square. Like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm not selling the North East very well. Sorry. All of our players live in Newcastle anyway. Yeah. Or Durham or Newcastle, so. to, to be fair, right, Newcastle's decent enough for a night out, though, isn't it? And even if people could say, well, they live in Newcastle, so what? It's not like 20 miles away from Sunderland, is it? So. No, but I think that one of the problems they have is that I was, uh, a couple of years ago now, I was on a night out in Newcastle, and I think it was Musa Sissoko, High Dar, and a couple of other Newcastle players were out. So there were a few Newcastle fans going, like, oh, can, can we get a picture? We had a picture, and they were like, no, no, like, we don't want people to know that, that we're that we're out. We don't want people to know that we're on the town. We can't take any pictures. Whereas if they if those players are playing in London, like so, so go now with Tottenham, there's diff, there's certain clubs and places like that where only people like him can get into. Where there's not that yeah. worry of, of fans taking pictures of them and them getting in almost in trouble for being out. Mm. I think that yeah. kind of that part of their life is is big for it's big for professional footballers now. Fair enough. I didn't think of that actually. Yeah, I can say that. Like, obviously, living in London, you very rarely see football players out. You know, very rarely. Yeah. Well, anyways, I think we're pretty much just about to wrap it up. Um, one last thing I will quickly mention is not really to do with Sunderland, but I just want to, just just for fun, just get thoughts on it. What do you two think about the Rooney and Lukaku deals? Well, obviously, Rooney's gone through. He's gone through to Everton, back on a two-year deal. And it looks like Lukaku's all but going to go to Manchester United. And I don't know if the fee's either 75 million or 90 million, but either way, it's a massive figure. Just quickly get your thoughts on either of them and feel free to start with whichever deal. Right. Um, Rooney, I think, is a pretty solid move for Everton, to be honest with you. I think that I'm, I'm going to be making a video on it pretty soon for my YouTube channel about the way that he was treated by Manchester United fans. Because if you actually go and look at what he did for the club and the way that, I'm not saying the majority of United fans, but there's a big proportion of them who were just giving him so much abuse. And you just think, if imagine if a player had come to Sunderland and done anywhere near the equivalent of what he'd done. For example, he scored, I think it was 11 goals against Manchester City. Imagine if you had a strike with Sunderland who'd scored 11 goals against Newcastle. Mm. Be, if you have a statue next to Bob Stoke outside the stadium, like it's it just, it, I think the way that he was treated by United was... A bit ridiculous to be honest and I still think that he does have the quality to play in the Premier League maybe not all 38 games but he can definitely be an impact player for Everton and he, he would offer Lukaku, something though wouldn't he what was that sorry he said he would definitely offer something for them though wouldn't he oh 100% yeah. of course he would yeah definitely would he's he's, he's 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 still got quality he's still a good player 100% he is and I think on the Lukaku deal if you look at the amount of goals that he scored over the last two seasons I can totally understand that transfer and one point I made to someone, I was saying, imagine that, imagine if Lukaku was English, imagine the hype there would be around the amount of goals he's got, performances he put in. Yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, Lukaku, is Lukaku only, what, 23 as well? Yeah, he's not, he's not old at all. You I know, think him and Harry Kane are around about the same age. They've scored around about the same amount of goals, yeah. yet and then, there's well, obviously a lot more hype around Harry Kane. Well, if that's, if, that, if that's the case then, you might as well look at um, how much would Harry Kane go for in today's market. You know, yeah, and if, if that that would get to triple. That would get to triple Harry figures. Al- Sorry for interrupting again. That would be into triple figures alone. That oh, of course it would. Because if someone said seventy-five million for Harry Kane, everyone would go. That's nowhere near enough. Not in, not what not the money that's getting paid out today. So yeah, I think I think it's fair enough the the price they're paying for. It, to be honest, well, with Lukaku as well, you hear you know other football fans saying, well, he he doesn't do it in the big games. Well, I'm sorry, like, but if you look at his record, he's actually probably. He, I think he definitely has scored the most goals against the top six teams last season. Mm, yeah, exactly. Right along with Harry Kane, so that's not an argument. 
So yeah, I think he'll be successful at Man United. He was, like. Yeah, he was top scorer in the Premier League last season if you discounted penalties. Yeah. So for that, open play, he scored the most goals in the Premier League. But it's the way that it, it's his movement and his athleticism that's very good as well, and his awareness of what's around him for a young age as well. It yeah. it says a lot. I think it's also quite sort of sort of full circleish sort of thing that Mourinho was the one who deemed him not good enough at Chelsea, and now he's prepared yeah. to pay like seventy five or ninety million for I him. Mean, it's, but it's I, funny, isn't it, when you look at Mourinho with um, I mean, the same thing with Mata, where he sold him at Chelsea, and then while he's been at United, he's been one of his stable players. Mm. It's, uh, it's I like Juan Mata a lot, actually. I think he's I a very, very good player. Mourinho's a clever guy, though. He'll let someone else do the groundwork for him, and then he'll pick him up when he's the finished article. Yeah. You true. know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's I just know. good business. To be fair, like... I mean, he wouldn't have developed the same way if he'd stayed at Chelsea, because no, he wouldn't have got the game time. You're right. I'll, t- I'll tell you the thing I will mention on this, then. With um with Rooney, I think it's a good it's a good enough signing for Everton. Uh, I think if they replace Lukaku, then they'll be fine. Um, I think they'll reduce the amount of goals that they're gonna they, they might they mightn't score as many, but I think they'll reduce the amount they're gonna concede. Because you've got Keane at centre back, Bobby Pickford in goal, who'll get them save them points on his own. And you look at Lukaku, I just think I'd expect Man United to be in a title challenge this season easily. Yeah, and I'd I'd also say don't discount Everton for sneaking in the top four because they've made some very, very good signs. If they'd held on to Lukaku, I would have almost said, listen, they're going to give a very serious challenge for the top four. Uh, but if they can if they can bring in a, a quality striker, the squad they're putting together, the, the, the Coleman's build is a very, very good side. I'll tell you one thing I will say on that. I don't think so at the minute, but if they get Sigurdsson and if they replace Lukaku, then I might probably agree with you. Replacing Lukaku is the big one, like isn't That's it? A I big mean, one. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. you got to remember got everything behind. It. But you got to remember though, that right, Even if they, you know, the Kaku's pretty much certain to go. If they get a striker who's going to get, say, fifteen goals a season, you got to remember they're probably going to try and look to get goals from other areas of the pitch, and they're still going to create a good number of chances with the players that they'll have. You know, you've I got mean, Morales also and need to, Ross Barkley's a big one. If they can hold, they need to hold on to him as well. I think because there might be a bit of interest sniffing around him, but if they can hold on to Ross Barkley, like you say, get a striker in who's going to score 15, 20 goals, something like that. I'm not sure what the situation is with Giroud now at Arsenal, with Luke, with Lagazette coming in, but whether or not that was an option for them, I think he would probably fit their style of play quite well. Yeah, so I think, I think player, probably, that kind of player would, I think, would yeah. make them give them a genuine challenge for the top four. Well. I guess time will tell in the next coming days. Right, guys, we're going to leave it there. So thanks for Cam for coming on. Actually, it's been a very, very privileged to have you on, mate. Um, I'll put a link to his channel. I say I'll put a link to it. I'll probably forget later. But hopefully I'll put a link to his channel in the description below. His videos are very good. Um, very underrated, actually. Should be getting more views. And obviously, cheers to Ben again for coming on. So, Pleasure as always. Yeah, exactly. So if I'm a correct friend, you're on holiday now, I think, aren't you? Yeah, fly out tomorrow. So, uh, yeah. so chances are, guys, if it's next I'll Monday... I'll be a bit blind. Yeah, don't worry. We'll we'll just kick Ben off for next week then. <laughs> um, well, if, if Ben, if Ben, so there's a chance that Ben might not be on next week, but if not, then hopefully he enjoys it. Thanks, guys, for watching. Um, comment, like, subscribe if you would wish to. And yeah, we'll see you all later. Hopefully, hopefully we we'll have some more permanent deals by next week. See you later. Thank you.